So I was saying this, that uh, a population is the entire or the entire group of items that you want to study. So if you find a case whereby you want to do an analysis, you want to investigate each and every item in the population, then you will be doing what we call a census. So a census, it is when you are doing an analysis to the entire population. Then if you do an analysis or you do some testing on part of the population, which we normally call a sample, then you are actually doing what you call sampling. But more importantly, note that sampling is the process of selecting a sample from the entire population. Then we can go ahead now and see the reasons why sampling is important. Why is it important to do a, an analysis on a sample instead of doing an analysis on all the entire items in the population. So the reasons are highlighted as below. One, it is on the cost. You will realize that the cost of doing analysis on all the items is going to be higher. Like for example, if we go back to our Kenya Bureau of uh, Standards, if it does analysis on each and every item that is produced by maybe an organization like Unga Limited, the cost will be higher because one, it shall need more personnel. And the other thing, it shall need more reagents to do the testing. Therefore, at the end of the day, you will find that the cost of doing uh, a census is more than the cost of doing uh, sampling. Then we also have the time aspect whereby the time that you are going to take to do a census, whereby you are investigating or interrogating each and every item, the time is going to be more as opposed to the time that you are going to do in doing the sampling. Then we have another reason, which is the destructive nature of certain tests. Certain tests, when they are being done, you find that it's like they destroy the item. Like for example, if we are doing a test on a, a, a packet of salt, we want to find out the reagents that are there and all that, you will find that we are going to destroy that packet of salt so that we can add some reagents and then confirm whether the ingredients are okay and in the right proportion. At the end of the day, you find that this packet has completely been destroyed because it has been mixed with the reagents. So if we do a, a census whereby we are testing each and every packet, you are going to find a case whereby we have destroyed all the packets that were produced by a certain organization. Because of the destructive nature of a certain tests, like the one that I've given as an example, you will find that now we can only do a sample. We do a test on a few packets, and then the results that we are going to get, we generalize to be the results for the entire lot, which is now the population. Then we have got the greater accuracy of results. When you concentrate, when all your effort is on a few items, you find that uh, you are going to be very accurate when you are doing those tests. The other thing is physically impossibility of checking all the items. You might find that maybe you are doing an analysis of uh, items whereby some are here, some others are actually outside the country and things like that. Bringing them together so that you can do a census or interrogate all of them becomes uh, quite impossible. And therefore, what you need to do, you pick on those which are available and then you do the analysis and then you generalize the findings from that analysis. And also the availability of uh, the population elements. You also can find a case whereby you are doing uh, maybe an analysis of uh, items which are in the, in the ocean or something like that. It becomes quite hard to get all the population elements for you to be able to conduct the, the sensor. So when we are talking about reasons for doing a sampling, it is actually the reasons for not doing a, a census. I think you understand what we mean as census, whereby in Kenya, we normally do it after 10 years, where each and every person is supposed to be counted. So the same case, it is applied when we go to research and analysis. After noting that, we can now go to the sampling procedure. The sampling procedure here, it is the process of selecting a sample. These procedures are broadly classified into two. We have got those procedures or methods we call probability sampling methods and those that we call non-probability sampling methods. If you can start with the first category of a probability sampling methods, this is a case whereby we leave chance to determine what item is going to be selected and which one is not going to be selected. If, for example, I have 10 items and I want to do analysis on only three, 
if I subject them in probability, then I can do something like a lottery, whereby I write the numbers and then I mix them and then I pick three. Those with yes, they qualify to be in my sample. Those with no, they are not in my sample. But the key point is this, everybody had an equal chance of being selected. There is no biasness here. Everybody is given the right treatment and has got a chance of being selected in the sample. That is actually what we call the probability sampling method. There is no biasness. You don't bring in your, your experience or your judgment or your, your feelings. You only leave everything to chance. Then we have got the following methods under the probability sampling methods. One, it is simple random sampling simple random sampling. This is like a case I've just given, whereby each and every item is given a chance of being selected. And a good example of simple random sampling is actually rotary. You find that maybe uh, I want three people, I just say maybe out of the 10, I just write the three, I write yes, and then the others I write no, I mix them together, and then the 10 people who are supposed to be selected, they are given an, a chance to pick a number. And then those who will pick yes, which is actually three, they are given that particular opportunity of being part of the sample. The others, they are not going to be in the sample. That is the simple random sampling. You have the advantages there, which I'm not going to, to give or to explain because actually you can be able to read it on your own. But the key thing is for you to understand how the method itself works. Then we have the systematic random sampling. The systematic random sampling, it is where items are arranged. If, for example, I have a population of 50 elements, I can arrange them and give them numbers. I can say, maybe I want a sample of 50 items from, 50, sorry, a sample of five from a population of 50. So I can decide to do this. I arrange them in a line and then I give them numbers like this. I give it one, two, three, up to 10. And then I start again, one, two, three, up to 10. I start again, one, two, three, up to 10. One, two, three, up to 10. So that I split those, uh, that population of 50 into 10, 10, 10, 10. And then I can randomly say this, those with the number four to come here. And then you realize the first number four, the second number four, the third number four, the fourth number four, and the fifth number four, they will come here and they become part of the sample. So that is what we mean here. You arrange the items and then you pick every cave item. So in this case, I have picked every fourth item to be part of the sample. That is what we mean by systematic. First of all, arrange all the elements, give them the, the numbers, but don't give them the numbers from number one to number last. You give them the number up to a certain point, like number one to 10, one to 10, one to 10. You can give one to five, one to five, one to five, depending on the sample size. If for example, they were uh, uh, 50 and I wanted a sample of 10, I'm going to pick maybe one to five, one to five, one to five, so that I have a, a 10 portion of one to five, one to five, one to five, and then maybe I can decide every number one and then they become part of the sample. That is what we refer with the systematic random sampling. The next method under the probability is uh, the stratified random sampling. The stratified random sampling is where, first of all, we group the population into groups that we normally refer as a strata. We group the entire population into small groups we call the strata, and the key thing about the stratified, this strata, they must be homogeneous. Homogeneous meaning that they must have the same characters or characteristics. Like a good example here, we can uh, have uh, something like this. We have uh, uh, a population maybe in Kenya, whereby we can divide the population into communities. Those uh, maybe who are speaking this particular tribe to be here, those who are speaking this tribe to be here. This, uh, so we group them first into tribes. We group them into tribes, uh, and I don't want to mention the tribes here. And then from each tribe, then we say maybe we want each tribe to give a certain number. When doing that, we can employ what we call proportional sample or non-proportional sample. Once you have uh, identified the strata, 
each and every strata has got elements which have got the same characteristic. In this case, they have got the same tribe. Once you have put them aside like that, then you can come here and employ either proportional or non-proportional. When we talk about proportional here, we mean like, for example, tribe A has got maybe 20 people. Tribe B has got 10 people. Tribe C has got five. If we employ proportional, we are going to mean that the tribe that has got more people should generate more people to be part of the sample. So if I, for example, I needed 10 people, I can say this because tribe A has got 20, let us give five. Tribe B, because it has 10, let it give maybe two. And the other one to give maybe this one to give maybe three and the other one to give two so that now we can have the, more, the one that has got more, it gives more to the sample. That is what we call proportional sample under the stratified. But I don't want you to lose track. First of all, group them into strata which are homogeneous. Then pick from each strata a certain number to go and form the sample. So you can find a case whereby five are picked from here, three from here, and then the other two from here if you add them, they give us 10, which is the required number to be in the sample. That is what we mean by the stratified. Then we have got uh, the, the cluster sampling. The cluster sampling, it is a case where by now you pick items and you group them into subgroups. And those subgroups are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous here means that they don't have the same characteristics. If, for example, I have the population, I can randomly say, can you group yourself into 10, 10, 10, regardless of your status, regardless of your tribe, then we shall have heterogeneous groups. From those groups, then I can decide now to pick a sample again from them. I can decide from those group, I, I do a random sample of maybe two, 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 so that they can give me the number of uh, the items that I need in the sample. So the difference between a cluster and a stratified is this. With the stratified, we normally group those items, first of all, into homogeneous. They must be of the same. And then in this case, we normally group them in heterogeneous, meaning that they don't have similar characteristics. And then from those groups, we can now pick a sample, and then we add them together to be the sample. That is actually what we mean there. And uh, having done that, those are actually the methods that fall under the probability sampling uh, technique. Then we have the non-probability sampling. Remember here again, I want to go back and remind you, with the probability sampling methods, everything is given the same chance of being selected. Every item has got the same chance of being selected to be part of the sample. But when we come to the non-probability sampling techniques, you find that the items are not given similar chance of being selected into the sample. There is some form of biasness. The person who is picking the sample either uses his experience, he can decide this person to be part of the sample and that one, this one should not be part of the sample. So there's some kind of dictation from the person who is selecting the sample on what should fall in the sample and what should not fall in the sample. And actually that's why they are known as an unprobability because chance is not given an opportunity here. Then we have got the following methods under the non-probability. Number one, we have the convenience or accidental sampling. This is a case whereby you select a sample based on availability or how easy is it to get that particular item. Like for example, if you, one of the students in the CHRM, you are to pick a sample or you are conducting a research of uh, students in Nairobi colleges, and here, it is not restricted on which college. Most of you will find a case whereby you will be interviewing students from CHRM because of their easy availability. So you are choosing them because they are available and you are avoiding maybe uh, students from KCA and other colleges within the town because they are not available or they are not within reach from your point of view. So convenience is where you pick something to the sample because of its availability. If maybe you are doing a research about maybe the number of children in the, in, uh, or the average number of children in uh, households, you will find most of you will do this research on the neighbors because it is easier to access them and such kind of thing. 
and you leave the others because of the unavailability. That is now picking a sample because of convenience. And there, you are not giving the others similar opportunity of being selected to be part of the sample for analysis. Then we have got the purposive sampling. The purposive sampling is a case where you pick a particular sample because of your objectives that you want to meet in your study. Like for example, if I'm doing an analysis on uh, the number of times a person reads a Bible, and uh, in uh, a population where I'm going to base my research, we have got Muslims and Christians. You will find that I'm going to exclude the Muslims and concentrate on the Christians because of the nature of my study. If I pick the Muslims, then I'm not going to get the information that I need simply because they read the Quran and not the Bible. So that is the purpose. If you leave some items because they are not going to give you the information that uh, you intend to gather. Then we have got another one we call the quarter sampling. The quarter sampling, it is where certain items must be selected. Let me put that word. Like in Kenya, you have heard about this thing of a, a third rule, a third rule whereby if it is a, a, maybe an interview, there must be a female, a quarter of, the, of, the, of those who are going to be hired a third, sorry, not a quarter, a third of those who are going to be hired, they must be female. So you will find there is some dictation here. You are not leaving everything to chance such that the best may be candidate to win. Uh, if uh, there were three vacancies and maybe there were 10 applicants and there were maybe three females, you find that uh, these females in a one way or another, they are favored or the other gender is favored, something like that. And uh, a case is where all of them cannot be male and all of them cannot be female. And uh, that is a case of the quarter. You can find other aspects, like uh, uh, when uh, national exams are being conducted, you normally find a case whereby those students from the marginalized communities are normally favored through this quarter system. You find if the entry was C+, plus, sometimes they can roll it up to the C+, because of that. Those who are physically challenged, the blind and all that, they normally go to the university at a slightly entry level than uh, the others. So such kind is what we normally refer as uh, the quarter. Even in employment, you have heard this advertisement. Uh, maybe female and people with disabilities are highly encouraged. That is actually employing the quarter system in doing the, that particular initiative. So that is what we mean by the quarter sampling also, whereby a certain proportion must come from a certain set. And therefore, you are not leaving everything to chance. There is some uh, dictation and or there is some biasness that is being employed. Then we have got what we call the snowball sampling. Snowball sampling, it is a case whereby as a researcher, you don't have enough information concerning a certain phenomenon. And therefore, you can only rely on referrals you can only rely on referrals because you don't have uh, enough information or that field is very new to you. Like for example, if you are doing a research on people who are doing uh, or are using uh, illegal drugs, people who are using it, it is very hard for you to go and find those people anyhow. What you normally do, maybe you know only one, you can rely on that one who will refer you to another person and then you are referred to another person like that so that you can gather the information of maybe why they are using them and all that. You, re, you use the referrals. That is actually what we call the snowball. You are not using the probability, but you are relying on uh, who referred to you. you. You are referred to a certain person and then you take that particular person to be a sample as you look for another person like that. So if you look for people through referrals to be part of your sample, then you are using what we call snowball sampling. That is actually the basis or the end of the sampling theory. But I want you to go ahead and uh, make yourself uh, conversant with the advantages and the disadvantages of each because they are briefly highlighted there. But the key thing, the moment you have understood what they mean, you can be able to relate them with the advantages and the disadvantages that are given. I want to pause at that point and ask for maybe questions from your end. Any part that you did not understand, you can raise it here before I proceed to the next bit. Uh, 
anybody with a question. And always feel free to ask because there's no point of uh, you maybe remaining silent and then you go and say you did not understand. It is the high chance you come on board and uh, seek clarification. Just feel free to interrupt me even if it is 10 times for the sake of you understanding a concept better. Any question from that discussion? Macrine. Yes, please. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm also fine. Uh, I know you normally ask questions. Any <laughs> questions? <laughs> no, I'm okay. I'm just waiting for the calculation bit and <laughs> okay, or this, rather the the, the other bit. Okay. To see, to see, they are there to see how it's the application. No, no, the, 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 the sampling theory does not have the calculations. Eh? At uh, this level, we normally look at uh, what it is and the methods of sampling, not forgetting maybe the reasons why we do the sampling. It, is, it remains at that point. And uh, if you check on all the past papers of uh, QM, you will find that uh, those are actually the questions that are going to be asked. Either the advantages of that and uh, maybe the meaning of these methods. What do you mean by snowball sampling? Okay. But uh, I want to maybe you to confirm that uh, the explanation has been okay, you have understood them? Eh? Yes, yes, yes. I'm okay. I don't know if the, the rest have uh, a problem. I'm, I'm okay. Okay. If anybody has, uh, you have, uh, you are free. You are free to raise your, your point. It can be a clarification. It can be, maybe you can even comment and maybe expound on the same. It, in us, it is not necessarily a question. But uh, if you all feel you are comfortable with that bit, then I can say we are done with the sampling theory. I can proceed to the next one, which is uh, probability. The probability, just a minute. Our next area of discussion is on probability theory. Probability theory. I know it's an area that was covered somewhere in high school. And uh, that is actually the point where we shall start from, the, what we learned in high school, and then we can go a bit deeper in this particular higher level. Probability is simply the possibility or the likelihood or the chance of something happening. That is actually what we call probability. How likely is it that something is going to happen? That is what we refer as a probability. How likely is it that today is going to rain? So if you find that the, maybe the weather is very cloudy and chilly, then there's high probability it might rain. But if you find that the weather is very warm and the sky is very clear, then there is very little probability that uh, it will rain. So that computation or calculation involving likelihood or possibility of something happening is what we refer as a probability. Probability, the answer, the answer for probability, any question that is talking about probability, its answer will always range from zero to one. The minimum answer you can ever get in a probability question is zero, and the highest answer you can ever get in probability is one. So always in your answers, you find either it is zero point something, or if it is in fraction form, the numerator is smaller than the denominator, always. That is uh, the probability, where if you find the answer in a probability question is zero, then it simply means that uh, that event will never happen. If I come here and I say that the probability of raining today is zero, then I simply mean that today it is not going to rain. 
today it is not going to rain at all. I'm so sure about it and it's not going to rain. So a probability of zero is that uh, the event will never happen. A probability of one means that the event must happen. The event must happen. There is, uh, there is certainty there that it must happen. If I say that uh, the probability of raining today is one, then I'm simply saying that today it must rain. Today it must rain. Then you'll find that a probability that is very close to zero, if you find your answer is maybe 0 0.01, eh, which is very close to zero, then it simply means that there is a very minimal chances of that event happening. But if you find that your probability is almost one, like the probability of 0 0.98 or 0 0.94, then it simply means there is high likelihood the event is going to happen, though you are not so sure about it, but it is high likely. So the scale is zero to one, where zero is uh, the event will never happen, one, the event must. The more closer to one, the more likely it will happen. The more closer to zero, the less likely the event is going to happen. And when it is 0 0.5, then we mean that uh, it is 50-50. It might or it may not happen. It is 50-50. So having maybe said that, allow me to take you through the common terms, common terms that are used in probability, what they mean. The first one is uh, what we refer as the random experiment. A random experiment is actually is something that is done that uh, generates outcomes. Something that is done that generates outcome is what we call a random experiment. You can take a coin and toss it upwards, and then you want to know whether the head or the tail is going to face up. Where the head, it is actually the part of the coin that has uh, the, the, what can I call, the, 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 the picture. The picture of maybe the former president or all that. Eh? Whereas the tail is the other side where we have the coat of arms, the two lions and all that. So you, if you toss the coin, the aspect of tossing the coin upwards, you are doing an experiment. You are doing an experiment. Or alternatively, you can be rolling a die. A die is something like a tube that has got six faces. If you throw it and uh, you want to note the side that it is going to show up, those six faces are normally labeled number one to six. So you want to know whether the side that is numbered one is going to be up or number two or number three, number four, number five or number six. If you roll it, once you roll it, you are actually uh, doing what you call a random experiment. Then the other term that is commonly used is what you call the outcome. The outcome here now is the result. Once you do an experiment, you have got the possible results. If you toss a coin, which is now an experiment, the results can either be head or tail. The same case, if you roll a die, the results can either number one, two, up to six. If you go to a game, you can either win, lose, or go for a draw. So those are actually the outcomes. Win, draw, or, uh, win, draw, or lose is actually the outcomes. Laning or not raining is actually the outcomes. Then we have got what we call a trial. A trial is the repetition of an experiment. If I toss the coin first, I have done the first trial. If I toss twice, then is that is the second trial, and so on and so forth. So it is the repetition of experiment is what we call a trial. Then we have got what we call sample space. Sample space, it is actually a set or a group of all the possible outcomes that can come from an experiment. Like for example, if you go for an experiment whereby you are in a match, the sample space is actually you win, you lose, or you draw. There is no any other outcome that can come out of the three. Those are all the possible results. So a set of all the possible outcomes is what we call the sample space. If you go under maybe, maybe toss the coin twice. If you toss the coin twice, you can either have head and head. That is the first result is the head up. The second is head up again. It can be head tail. It can be tail head or it can be tail tail. Those are all the outcomes. There is no any other results that you can come 
up with apart from those four. If you exhaust all the possible outcome, then you have come up with what we call the sample space. Then we can talk about an event. An event of an experiment is actually a subset of the sample space. Like for example, I've said in a match or in a competition, it is either win, lose, or draw. If I take one of them, if I take maybe a draw, then I'm having an experiment, an, an event, sorry. I'm having an event, a section or a portion of the sample space. If I had head, 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 tail, tail, head, and tail, tail, if I take tail, tail, then it is a, an event out of the sample space. It is an event out of uh, the sample space. Then we have got this term known as the mutually exclusive events. The mutually exclusive events. I beg for you to understand this one better because uh, it is highly used. Actually, if you are told to explain the meaning of terms used in probability, you rarely miss this. And actually, as we move to the next step, which is the laws of uh, probability, you will find again, we are going to mention these mutually exclusive events severally. Therefore, it means this. These are events. Remember events, we have said it is a subset from the sample space. You take a particular result from the sample space, the one of it is, becomes a, an event. So it is an event or events which cannot occur at the same time. Events which cannot occur at the same time. If this one has happened, then the other ones will never happen then the other ones will never happen. So events are said to be mutually exclusive if they cannot happen at the same time. Meaning that the happening of one excludes or eliminates the possibility of the others happening. A good example is uh, something like uh, raining and not raining. There is no way raining and not raining can happen at the same time. Either it rains, or it does not rain. Either you win, you draw, or you lose. But there is no way you can win and draw at the same game at the same time. Either we have got quite a number. Either you pass or you fail. But you cannot have the two of them happening at the same time. So those events which cannot happen at the same time are known as the mutually exclusive events. Then we have got what we call the correctively ex exclusive events. The correctively exclusive events or exhaustive events is uh, actually similar to the sample space. It is actually a correction of all the possible outcomes in an experiment. Correctively exclusive, just related with the sample space. Then we have got the favorable events, which refers to the number of possible out occurrences of a, a given event. Like for example, if we, we are in a class where we have got uh, 12 girls and maybe 10 boys, we have got 12 girls and 10 boys in a, in a class, maybe in a primary school. The favorable outcomes or the favorable events of picking a girl out of that class, the possibility of picking a girl from that class, actually we have got 12 possible chances. Either we pick girl A, B, up to the 12th girl, because there are 12, so we have got the 12 possible uh, occurrences that can happen, which will favor the picking of a, a girl. That is now what we call the favorable events. You just note of the number of what you are interested with, then you divide by the total. So it's actually the probability will be 12 out of 22 the probability of picking a girl is going to be 12 out of the possible 22 students who are in that particular class. Then we have got uh, another very important term that I would like you to understand, which is known as the independent event. Independent events is actually like the opposite of mutually exclusive events. These are events which are not related and they can happen at the same time. Events which are not related and can happen at the same time are known as independent events. And uh, such events can be either passing, passing an exam, passing an exam and maybe uh, winning a game. 
there is no way they are related. You can pass exam and you go and win a game. Eh? There is no way they are related. So those events which can happen at the same time are known as uh, independent. As I indicated there, they are events where the happening or non-happening of one does not affect the happening or non-happening of the other event. Like if you toss the coin and uh, you roll the die, or you toss the coin the first time, if the head shows up, it is not going to affect uh, the head showing up in the second tossing. Those are actually independent events. And then we have uh, equally likely events, whereby events are equally likely if the happening of one is not favored over the happening of the other. If we we toss a coin, actually it's a very good example. If we toss a coin and head shows up, it does not affect the happening of the other. Actually the tail is not affected by this. So basically you will find that those are the terms that are normally used in probability and are also very highly tested. Explain the meaning of this term as a, uh, used in probability theory. So those are the terms. Then if you go now to the second part, which is on um, the laws of probability, I want now to go and uh, demonstrate that the laws of probability, I will do it on uh, my board here on my tablet. Uh, let me stop sharing this. Let me open my notebook before I share. Okay, this is actually my notebook and I want us to discuss about the, the laws of probability, the laws of uh, probability. a minute. The laws of probability. This laws of probability, there are actually two. We have got uh, the law number one, which is known as the addition law. The addition law. And uh, number two, we have the multiplication law. But I want us to start with the number one, which is the addition law. The addition law normally makes use of uh, what we have called the mutually, mutually exclusive events. It is actually applied in the mutually exclusive events. Remember we said the mutually exclusive events are those events which cannot occur at the same time. And you'll find this addition law is also known as the OR. It's also referred as the OR, OR law, like that. One thing you can be able to note, if two things cannot happen at the same time, if I was to, put, to pick uh, one person from uh, two people, which is A and B. If I have two people, A and B, I want to pick one from them. You will find it is going to be a case of using the word or in that case. It is either I pick A or I pick B, but I cannot pick both of them. So the addition law is normally applicable in uh, cases whereby the events are mutually exclusive meaning they cannot occur at the same time. And uh, just as the word itself suggests, the addition law, we normally use addition sign. So 
basically, this is the rule that we normally apply. If uh, events A and B are mutually are mutually exclusive, then the probability probability of picking the probability of picking one is going to be equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B, like that. That is what we mean. But at this point, before I go deeper, I want to make your understanding quite simple. If, for example, we have got uh, items, if we have got this, we have got uh, a, a bucket that uh, has got balls, where we have got, uh, let me talk about here the balls, we have got those balls which are red, we have got those balls which are maybe black, and we have got those balls which are maybe white. And those which are red are actually maybe five, these are three, and maybe these are four. You refine this. The total number of balls which are going to be in that bucket are going to be, how many are these? This is eight plus four. Actually, we have a total of 12 balls in that bucket. You will find if we have got 12 balls in that bucket, the probability of red, the probability of red is actually going to be five over the total. So it's going to be five over the total, which is 12. The probability of uh, black is going to be the number of black, which is three over the total, which is 12. The probability of picking white is going to be the number of white balls over the total, which is 12, like that. So this is actually the probability of uh, white. So the moment you have that understanding, sorry. this is the probability of white is going to be equal to four over 12. So if the question now is asking you, what is the probability? You are told find the probability of picking a red or black ball. We are told what is the probability of picking a red or a black ball. You should come here and say the probability of red or black will be given by, remember here we are using the word or, and any the time you are using the word or, we are using the addition law. So this is the same as the probability of picking red. Because of this or, we use the addition plus the probability of picking actually black. It is the probability of red plus the probability of black, which in this case, we have got uh, the probability of picking red is 5 over 12 and black is 3 over 12. So we can come here and you say it is 5 over 12 plus 3 over 12, which will be equal to 8 over 12, which actually can be simplified because 4 can go here, 4 can go here, is two over three. That is actually what we mean by the addition rule. Anytime we cannot pick the two of them, we don't want to pick red and black. We only need either red or black. So it is the probability of red we add to the probability of black. And upon adding those probabilities, you get the answer. If the question was talking about uh, the probability the probability of uh, maybe black and, uh, or sorry, not and, but or white. If the question was talking about the probability of black or white, this is the same as the probability of uh, black plus a probability of white. And uh, you can pick it for black. For black, the probability was three over 12 for white was four over 12. So we can come here and we add those probabilities, three over 12 plus four over, this is four over 12, 
we find that this one is going to be 7 over 12. That is the answer. So anytime we are using the or, we normally do the addition. You can be given a question like this. You can be given a question like this, where you are told, in a class, we have got uh, maybe three categories. We have uh, in a class, students come from, maybe we can say, come, let me paraphrase this. Not from, but uh, they come using. We have maybe others come using the bicycle, others come using walking, and others use maybe, let me say, the matatu. So those who are uh, using bicycle or those who are cycling, there are maybe 10. These are actually maybe 13. And those who are using matatu, they are nine. So you can add so that you can be able to know how many students are in that class. This is 23. So the total, they are going to be that two. So if I go into that class and I want to pick a student who comes to that particular class by bicycle, the probability of picking the one with the bicycle is going to be equal to 10 over 32. The probability of picking those who are walking is going to be, these are, those who are walking is going to be equal to 13 over 32. Sorry, over 32. And the probability of those who are using the matatu are going to be 9 over, this is 9 over 32. Then you can be asked, what is the probability of picking a student who uses a bicycle or matatu? So it is a matter of adding the probabilities for picking a student with a bicycle plus the probability of picking a student who uses the matatu. So the OR rule is applicable when you are using addition or addition sign is used when we are using OR. And the OR rule is going to be applicable in the mutually exclusive events whereby we don't want two events to occur at the same time. You only want one out of uh, the possible uh, events that are happening. So that is what we refer as the mutually exclusive events and the addition rule. Then we have got the second rule. The second law of uh, probability is known as the multiplication law. The multiplication law. With the multiplication law, it is also known as the AND. It is also known as the AND rule. This law is applicable in uh, events we call independent. Remember what we said about independent events? These are events which the happening of one does not affect the possibility of happening of the other meaning that both can happen at the same time. And that's why we are using the word and here. And we are using the word here. So we can have a case whereby we want to select A and B. So we want both of them to be selected or there's a possibility of both of them being selected. Like for example, you can have a case here where you are told the probability, the probability of uh, Raining is maybe three over seven, while the probability of, uh, of winning is maybe two over five. You can be asked, what is the probability? You calculate the probability of raining and uh, winning that game. You defined this one, probability of uh, reigning and uh, winning 
is going to be given by this is the same as probability of raining. Because of this word and, we normally use the multiplication because we are using now the multiplication rule times the probability of winning. Times the probability of winning. So you will find it is going to be a case of uh, 3 over 7 times 2 over 5. So you can get this one to be 6 over 35. And that is the end of it. So these rows are actually applicable depending on the statement. If the statement is using the AND, then automatically use the multiplication law. If the statement is using OR, then you use the addition rule. We can have another example. You can be tested on this. There's another way you can be tested on this, where you are given something like a table, where you are given a table, where we can have uh, maybe the games. The games, maybe we can talk about football. We can talk about uh, volleyball and maybe swimming. And on this side, we can talk about the male and uh, the female participants. On this end, I want us to have a column for the total. And here we also need to have a column for the total. Maybe the males who are doing football, they are uh, 25. Those who are doing volleyball are maybe 13. And those who are swimming are maybe seven. In a total, these are going to be 20 plus 25, which is actually 45. They are 45 in total. Those who are, those females who are maybe doing football, they are 18. Those who are doing volleyball, let's say they are 20. And those who are swimming, they are maybe nine. You will find these one are going to be how many? This is uh, 38 plus nine, which is actually 40, 47. 47 eh? Then we can have the total downwards. The total of uh, volleyball, both bo uh, male and female, are going to be what? This is uh, 1343. Those who are doing volleyball, both male and female, they are uh, 33. Those who are doing swimming, male and female, they are 16. And you find that now, if you add this a close, it's going to be the same as the addition of this. And I tend to believe 45 plus 7, this one will be 2. Carry 1, this one will be 92. If you add them, this 92 is the grand total now. 92 here is the grand total of all the participants. Though you can be asked now something like this. Find the probability of picking... Uh, let me come here now. We are looking for the probability... of picking a student who plays football, of picking a student uh, or a participant who is uh, playing football, or let us go to all, first of all, all swimming. What is the probability of picking a participant who is uh, doing uh, football or swimming? So you need to understand here, those who are doing football all of them are 43. But this 43, it is 43 out of the 92 people that we have. So probability of uh, football, probability of football will be equal to 43 out of 92, out of this total. The probability of uh, the swimming or picking a participant who is doing swimming will actually be what? There are 16 swimmers out of the 92 participants. So it's going to be actually 16 out of 92. Here we are assuming that a participant participates in only one event. Eh? So the probability of, uh, probability of football and uh, swimming would be equal to the probability of swimming, which is uh, football, sorry, which is 43 over 92, plus the probability of uh, picking a swimmer 
which is going to be 16 out of 92. So you add the probability. I want you to try this one for me. From this table, maybe somewhere. Determine the probability of uh, picking. Determine the probability of uh, picking a participant in variable, a participant in variable or football. Participant in volleyball or football. Volleyball or uh, football? What are you getting? Sorry, come again, Damaris. 76 out of 92. 76 over 92. Eh? Anybody with a different answer from this? Just a simplified one. Yes. Eh? 19 over 23. Or a simplified of this, eh? because actually it can cancel out. Eh? I think uh, then it's okay. I tend to believe uh, you are looking for the probability of variable or football. volleyball or football. So it, I tend to believe you did this. The volleyball, they were 33 out of 92. And then we add for the football, which is 43 out of 92. You find this one is going to be 76 over 92, which actually can be simplified as Lucare as uh, correctly indicated. That is okay. I want you to try this. B, the probability of uh, the probability of uh, picking the probability of picking a male probability of picking a male and a footballer. Probability of picking a male and a footballer. Probability of picking a male and a footballer. Let me assist you in that. Probability of picking a male. Probability of picking a male. First of all, you need to know what was the total number of males. The total number of males, they were 45 out of uh, 92. 
And then the probability of a footballer we know is actually, this is a footballer, is given by 43 out of 92. So, and here we are talking about the case of and. So you do the necessary. I'm sure you have multiplied that because it is and because it is and we are supposed to come here and multiply the two probabilities which is 45 over 92 times 43 over 92 then you get the correct answer you get the correct answer you just multiply the numerators which is 45 times 43 over the product of the denominators you get determine the answer for that I want you to try the last one. Excuse me. Yes, yes, Glory. Excuse me. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, are we using the total of the footballers or we are just taking the number of the males, which is 25? Okay, repeat the question. The question was? The probability of picking a male and a footballer. The probability of picking a male, eh? a male competitor, see uh -huh. all, and all... A football. come again. You are saying a male, the question was, and a footballer, and a footballer. Eh? Now, here, let us agree. Yeah. Eh? The males, they were how many? The males, they were 45. The males, they were? 45, yeah. 45. Eh? So here, I want to explain yeah. this. When we talk about the probability of a male and a footballer, it is simply, first of all, the probability of the male or the males and uh, now see, kuna multiplication because of and, eh? and the probability of yeah. footballer. Eh? I tend to, be, to, to see yeah. your argument. Eh? But if the question was asking the probability of picking a male footballer, if we are the, 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 the question was asking about uh, what is the probability of picking a male footballer and maybe something else, we could have used 25. But this question is saying probability of male and uh, footballer. Are you getting the difference uh, there, Glory? Broly? Yeah, I've got you. Thank you. Yes, yes. The question was male and a footballer, but not a male footballer. Eh? If it was a male footballer, then we could have concentrated on the 25 out of 92. But because it is a male and a footballer, it is the probability of male times the probability of a footballer. And then you get it like that. I think you have uh, reminded me we can do one. We can do one. Where you are asked this question, determine the probability of picking a female swimmer, the probability of picking a female swimmer, and a male volleyballer the probability of picking a female swimmer and a male volleyballer. Female swimmer and a male volleyballer.
so we need to, first of all to start with the probability we need to get the probability of uh, of picking a female swimmer the probability of picking a female swimmer a female swimmer they were only nine out of the 92 so it's going to be nine over 92 and then the probability of picking a male volleyballer a male volleyballer will be actually be equal to male volleyballer they are 13 there are 13 males who are playing volleyball so it is 13 out of 92 so the two probabilities are supposed to be multiplied simply because we are using and so you are going to get 9 over 92 times 13 over 92 then you work out that and you simplify your answer where possible it is going to give you the solution to that when uh, you are given a question that is involving a table this table we normally refer to it as a contingency yes yes please yes i have a question yes please ask um since you are asking about the female why don't you use the total number of females if it's the female swimmer and the male volleyballer why don't you use the total number of females and the total number of males Okay, I've heard your question. Because they were swimmers, huh? female, mm -hmm. they were female swimmers and then the, then the male volleyballer. But remember, all these participants are uh, grouped together. Yeah? They are all together. So if you are looking for the probability of any one of them and they are all together, then it must be over the total which is uh, 92 when they are all together we normally use the total of 92 because we cannot have a case whereby if they were separate if all the males and the females maybe were separate then we could have used maybe 9 over 47 and the other one could have been maybe 13 over 45 but now if they are all together the denominator will remain to be 92. yes Uh, have I asked, uh, answered your question? Okay, I think I want to ask around the same area. Um, I feel also lost. Yes. Yeah. Um, so at any point you're working on a probability, yes. you must work with the total population. You can't work with, um, like let's say you've been asked uh, the, the uh, female swimmer and uh, male volleyball. Female. So uh, I think, of course, because what I thought we should do was that 13 out of 33 times 9 out of 16. So at any point, we need to work with the total population, of which is 92. Yes. If all the elements are together, yeah? if all the males and the females, we grouped them together and we want now to pick uh, one out of that, uh, you will find that we are picking one out of uh, the total of 92, which are together. It is like a case whereby you have mixed maybe the balls together in one sack eh? and you want to get, you know, the, the white are 10 eh? and the black are maybe 5. But the probability of picking a particular color, it must be the number of those uh, in the, that particular color or with those particular color divided by the total eh? because actually they are contained in one area. If we talk about this, okay. if we talk about maybe 13 over 33, then you simply mean that uh, the others, uh, the others, they don't have an opportunity of being selected. Those who are playing football and those who are doing the swimming, they don't have any opportunity of being selected. We are using 32 because there is an opportunity of selecting somebody who is not a swimmer and who is not actually a female swimmer, who is maybe a male footballer simply because they are together. From where we are picking this, they are all together there. So they also stand an opportunity of being selected. Are you together? Yes? Yes. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That is actually the argument we okay. normally place it here. Okay. Okay. To reinforce that, uh, there's that question that I shared on WhatsApp. Uh, on a past paper, there's something about the managing director, something, a question that was touching something to do with that. Uh, Rukale, you, I know you always write them down. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm just opening it where it is. Okay, okay. Let us give you some minutes. Okay, I can read. Eh? Okay, read. A company advertised for a position of a managing director. Yes. The number of, of applicants for the position were 50. Applicants, they were 50. Out of which 10 were shortlisted for interview. Uh huh. So twisted, they were ten. Eh? Uh huh. Yes. Determine the probability that an applicant selected at random will be a shortlist. Determine the probability that an applicant was a shortlisted. A. We are looking for the probability that a candidate was a shortlisted. Shortlisted. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let us work. B. Uh, just hold on. Okay. To, uh, let us uh, work on this first. What is the probability that the candidate uh, was shortlisted? If a candidate is picked at random, eh, what is the, the probability that uh, the candidate is uh, shortlisted? Uh, let me hear from you. Let us uh, have it like a discussion eh, and then we agree on the way forward. Uh-huh. Look. Somebody to try, just try. There's no problem with trying. One over five. Ten over fifty, which is one over five. Uh-huh. That is McLean. Ten over five. Anybody who feels uh ten over fifty, which is a uh huh. Anybody else with uh a different answer or feels the answer is uh, something different. Lukale, well known and I'm Nagan. I feel the same with McLean. Yes. That it is a 10 over 50, which is a 1 over 5. I, I also agree with you. It's actually the probability that uh, the person will be shortlisted is going to be the total number of those who are shortlisted over the total number of applicants. So you will find that uh, the probability is going to be one over five. That is the probability that a candidate picked at random will be shortlisted. Uh -huh. Part B. Part B is a. Uh... Shortlisted and employed as a managing director. Obviously, we all know money uh, employed, when we are talking about employed, it is going to be one person. Eh? Only one person will be employed. So, can you come again and look at it? Determine the probability that an applicant was shortlisted. Uh -huh and employed as a managing director. You're trusted and employed. That is what we are working on. You need to note this. The probability for being shortlisted, we have already worked it out. Eh? The probability of being shortlisted is a uh, one over five times the probability of being employed. What is the probability that uh, the person will be employed? That is what we need to multiply here because any time we have and, we normally use the multiplication.
what is the probability that uh, the person will be employed? Any trial, any trial? I can try that it is uh, Can it one? be one over 10? One over 10. Uh -huh, one over 10. Uh -huh. Because we are getting it from the list of the employed people, of the shortlisted people. Uh -huh. Lucalo, you were saying something? Uh, for me, I feel it is one over five. One over five. Because we are we are doing it one of five times the probability of being employed, which is one over one, which is the same as one. So we will multiply get one over five. Uh, sorry, come again, come again there. I'm saying that uh, we take the probability of being shortlisted, uh, which is one 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 over five. Uh, uh -huh. Then we multiply by the probability of being employed. Uh -huh. Now, which is one. The probability of being employed is one. Okay, as we, are ask, we are asking this question. Eh? What is the probability that the applicant is going to be employed? That is what actually we want to know so that we can multiply here. Uh, somebody has said one over ten. Uh -huh. You you had said one over five. I don't know whether you want to change this answer to Kare. Okay, I want to ask another question now so that we can answer this. Eh? This question is asking what is the probability that a candidate is going to be shortlisted and employed? Eh? What about if it is a question of uh, the candidate is uh, is uh, short uh, is uh, is employed given that he was shortlisted? If it is like this, employed given that he was uh, shortlisted. But this one, I know it's going to confuse you much better because it's going to employ something that I, I don't want you to be, get confused. Let us come back here. What is the probability that the candidate is going to be employed? Somebody can come here and argue this. The way you have argued here is one over 10. is actually one person out of the 10 shortlisted. Somebody might think it is going to be uh, maybe one out of the 50 applicants. Now, let us, uh, uh, or maybe I put it as a question. Between one and a 10, which is one out of the 10 shortlisted and one out of the possible applicants, which one should we use? Just cover the Yes, I'm saying this. Eh? There is one over 10. Eh? One over 10, mm -hmm. remember, it is one who is going to be employed mm -hmm. over 10 who are shortlisted. Or one over 50, one who is going to be employed over the 50 applicants. See, um, for one to be employed, you first ought to be shortlisted. So I believe it's still one over 10. Uh -huh. You still maintain your point. Anybody who can feel something else? Actually, it is true. The probability, first of all, if you are not shortlisted, if you are not shortlisted, you are out. If you are not shortlisted, you are out. So when we are picking the person for employment, then we are picking from the 10. We are picking from the 10 who are shortlisted. So we are not going again to subject all the 50, but we are going to now to select from the 10. So it's going to be one over 10. So you refine the answer is going now to be equal to one over 50. One over 50. That is how you are supposed to argue. On the employed part, our concentration is going to be on these 10 that were shortlisted. That is okay. I agree with you fully.
Uh -huh. Lucale, give us the last part. Determine the probability that an applicant was shortlisted but never employed. Okay, the applicant was shortlisted and never employed. That me reminds uh, that reminds me of uh, something that I need to explain here before we do that question. It is like this: as far as probability is concerned, eh? probability probability of event happening probability of event happening plus probability of the same event not uh, the same event not happening will always be equal to one it is very important for you to note that the probability of uh, an event happening plus the probability of the same event not happening must equal to one. Like for example, if you are told the probability of raining, if you are told that the probability of raining is two over three, then you should be able to get the probability of not raining from here. The probability of not raining would be equal to one minus two over three, which you will find is going to be a third. If you are given the probability of uh, maybe failing, you are given the probability of failing is a five over nine, the probability of the opposite, which is now passing, is actually given by one minus the probability of what you are given, which is going to be four over nine. That is actually something also very important for you to understand in probability. Probability of an event happening plus the probability of the same event not happening must add up to one. So if you are given here two over three, then if you add two over three plus the probability of not training must give you one. That's why we are subtracting. Remember, if this is two over three, then one is the same as three over three. Three over three minus two over three gives you one over three. If the probability of failing is five over nine, then one in this case is supposed to be given by nine over nine. Now, nine over nine minus five over nine is four over five, four over nine. If now we can employ this and we put it in the question that we have at hand, I will simply come and say this. If we are given the probability of being employed, if we are given the probability of being employed, let me put this one to be in bracket to be equal to one over 10. The probability of not employed, of not getting employed should actually be one minus one over 10, which is actually nine over 10. That is very important for this particular question. The probability of an event happening plus the probability of the same event not happening must add up to one. So if you are given one of the probability, the probability of the opposite is one minus the probability that you have been given or which you are able to calculate. So what was the question asking Lukare? The question was asking, Yes. shortlisted but never employed. Shortlisted but never employed. The probability of a shortlisted, shortlisted, we have the probability for being short, uh, shortlisted. The probability for being shortlisted, we said is what? Mm, they, it was 10 over 50, which is actually five, uh, one, over, one over five. Eh? Shortlisted, but never employed. Never employed is actually going to be nine over 10. The, nine over 10 here. So it is going to be one over five, the probability of being shortlisted times the probability of not employed, which is nine over 10. You will find this one is going to be nine over 50. So that is actually how you are supposed to reason out. But the key thing or uh, the hint was uh, here. This was actually the hint for everything you need to note that the probability of an event happening 
plus the probability of the same event not happening must add up to one. To wind up our today's discussion, I want us to do this question. I will give you like uh, five minutes, then I'll come and we do it and we end the class at that point. Uh, just write it down. Just write it down. It reads like this. It is well known that, it is well known that the probability of a student, the probability of a student carrying an umbrella, it is, known, it is well known that the probability of a student carrying an umbrella to, to school, carrying an umbrella to school is four over 11. It is four over 11. It is also known that, it is also known that the probability of raining in a particular day, it is also known that the probability of raining in a particular day is five over seven, is five over seven. Determine the probability of a student, determine the probability of a student, determine the probability of a student, A, carrying an umbrella and it rains. A, carrying an umbrella and it rains carrying an umbrella and it rains b b not carrying an umbrella but it rains 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 c not carrying an umbrella and it does not rain. Not carrying an umbrella and it does not rain. Not carrying an umbrella and it does not rain. So I want you to try it or, uh, or if we all agree, I can give you as a, as maybe as a classwork, you, you do it. And I still request you we meet on Saturday because this unit we cannot be able to rush. I give you between today and uh, Saturday, then we can be able to look at it as we move to the next bit, which is actually the probability distributions. Anybody with uh, maybe another suggestion? Excuse? Yes, Tecla. Can you repeat A? Sorry, I repeat? A. Question A. At A. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think it was uh, the probability of uh, carrying an umbrella and it rains. Carrying an umbrella and it rains. Is it okay? Tecla? Okay. You are, it's like a, your network has got some challenges, but uh, I hope I have- Thank you. Yes, it is. It okay. is. Thank you. Okay, Karibu. Okay. Can we agree that uh, we meet on Saturday and then you try that. I don't, there's no need of uh, doing quite a number of it. You also need some time to do the absorption. Yes, we meet on Saturday. 
we meet on Saturday our usual time from uh, 6 to 7. Okay, just try that. It is going to be of help for you. <coughs> yes, Tess. Excuse me. Uh -huh. can, we, can we change the time for, for Saturday from 6 to 6.30? We meet from 6.30 instead of 6. To 7.30, yeah? Yes. That is a suggestion from my end. I don't have any problem. We can do that. Anybody who is uh, who feels affected by shifting time from uh, six thirty from six to six thirty, I tend to believe it is uh, good. If you are not affected and uh, it is going to be of help to another person, then let us embrace that. Let us start it from six thirty to seven thirty instead of uh, from uh, six to seven so that we can be able to accommodate those who are engaged in something else. I think Tess, your request is accepted. Okay, thank you. So if that is the case, then I would request you to, I end this meeting at that point, and then we meet on Saturday from 6.30. Otherwise, I want to thank you for coming on board. And I wish you well in the remaining part of the week. Thank you very much. Enjoy your night. You too. Thank you. Bye. See you. See you.